Sunrise in the wilderness. The time when nature's voices sing a joyful dawn chorus. What we hear when we listen to the dawn chorus circle the planet is we really hear you know, life awaken to the future. Peace and quiet in our environment is very much an endangered species. There are very few areas left in North America and also the world where we can be alone anymore. Nature sound recordist Gordon Hempton takes us on an amazing adventure, a trek around the world to capture the dawn chorus on six continents before it vanishes forever. The noise of the city, rousing itself from sleep, disturbs the peace of early morning. The sound of a wilderness dawn is the song of peace itself. We hear the sun rise and that first line of light pass over the landscape. We hear life awaken. And it's been awakening ever since the dawn of life itself. Gordon Hempton is a man obsessed with preserving and sharing the pure sounds of nature. He's been making nature recordings in the Pacific Northwest for over 10 years and has heard pristine locations vanish one by one. Fearful that this may be happening elsewhere, that the peaceful symphony of the planet is being silenced by the noise of technology, Gordon Hempton set out to record what has become as rare as peace itself, the pure sound of sunrise as it travels around the world. pre-dawn hours, Gordon makes his final preparations. This will be a busy time throughout his journey. It's the time when he makes sure his constant travel companion is working. Let me speak openly about Fritz. You know, we've been together for a long time. We're partners. I could not do my business without him. Fritz is Gordon's nickname for his odd-looking recording device. His ears are two super-sensitive microphones placed inside a head-shaped mold of flesh-like plastic. This gives his recordings a three-dimensional quality of human hearing. Assured that Fritz is functioning, Gordon sets off to record his first acoustic portrait of Dawn. It will be the last familiar place he'll see for the next four months. northwestern tip of the United States. Rialto Beach is a very special beach to me. It's a beach that I believe offers one of the best listening experiences of the ocean surf that a person can have. Gordon sees his global recording as a sunrise symphony. He's decided to record the first movement on an isolated stretch of Washington coast, the place where he recorded with Fritz for the first time. Gordon calls himself the sound tracker. He uses his sophisticated recording system in much the same way that a nature photographer uses a camera to take a picture of what he calls a wilderness soundscape. In a split second, you can hold an image and walk away with it. The sound is different, it vanishes. It's very ephemeral, very delicate.
wonderful. 63 dBA, just uh, slightly below conversational level. We have the creek, Rialto Creek, entering into the Pacific Ocean. This fresh water supply in this saltwater environment is really a great attractant to wildlife. Wonderful opportunity for listening. Next to the stream, Gordon finds the perfect spot to record the beginning of his dawn chorus. Here, among giant driftwood logs from an ancient forest, the beach sounds have a unique resonance. At the place where he started, Gordon has captured the essence of beginning. The sounds in the womb, you can imagine, is this ocean surf, the heart surging back and forth. On Gordon's last night at Rialto, the surf he recorded gives a salt tang to his dinner. It is time to sit back and review his progress. Begin log for 9990. That's the magic number, and this morning was a very successful recording time. Started out 5 a.m., Rialto Beach, with a high and low perspective off the... Gordon knew that Rialto was one of the few places left on the American continent to get a pure recording of dawn, but he's uncertain about the success he'll have at his next location. Gordon and Fritz head west with the night catch the dawn rising over a necklace of volcanic peaks in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The Maui dawn can best be seen from the summit of Mount Haleakala, a place that has a long tradition of celebrating dawn. The volcano's name literally means House of the Rising Sun, and the early Hawaiians described dawn in the language of the listener as a first breeze, a second breeze, and the birds in between. The rhythmic sounds of a traditional chant are a plea to the goddess Laka for a successful venture. Gordon, not one to miss an opportunity, makes a recording for good luck on his journey. Then heads off in search of the pure Maui sound heard by the early Hawaiians. During the day, Gordon scouts various locations without Fritz, composing with his own ears. He can spend days listening for certain audible elements before bringing Fritz in to record. Once Gordon finds a site for a sound composition, he marks the spot with reflective tape. This way he can find his way back in the dark and be in position with Fritz at dawn. But finding satisfying sights on Maui isn't proving to be easy. Maui was, at one time, I'm sure, an island paradise. Maui today is one of the worst ecological disasters our century has produced. Humans have forever been altering it. On Maui, the sound seeker is quickly frustrated in a place full of sightseers. Gordon and Fritz enjoy playing tourist for a while, but Gordon quickly realizes that getting away from people on this island paradise is going to be a challenge. There's a problem with being a sightseer only, taking in only the sights. The picture is not complete. It has no depth, no music, no beat.
For this morning's dawn recording, Gordon has returned to a location he chose to represent Maui's morning sound in what seemed to be a remote spot below the peak of Haleakala. But as he tries to hear dawn rise through a chorus of birds, Gordon picks up something else. Haleakala sunrises have become as popular with tourists as they were with ancient Hawaiians. So Fritz's sensitive microphones pick up the noise of human activity. The morning's carefully scouted recording is ruined. Gordon grows concerned that he won't find pure nature sound anywhere on Maui. The island's only piece of wilderness is a large nature preserve called the Wakamoi, and it's usually off limits to visitors. To gain access, he turns to naturalist Mark White. Well, the air was extremely transparent. When we came out of this area just a little while ago, I noticed that I could see the highway, and I was twice as close as I was this morning. I could see the highway, but I couldn't hear it. And yeah. this morning, I could hear even the last one uh -huh. going all up to the top of the mountain. Yeah. After a day of futile searching, Gordon and Mark stumble across a small pocket of stillness in the bottom of a rock ravine. The next morning, Gordon will return to this spot for the last opportunity to record Maui's morning song. Gordon finally has the second movement of his dawn chorus. But little is left of this original voice of what was once an island paradise. Visually, Maui still has spots of unspoiled beauty, but pristine sound has all but vanished. Gordon's next location, across the Pacific and down under, may provide more solitude than he's ready for. Aborigine and the didgeridoo are two very unique parts of the outback where the Aborigine, I believe, actually becomes entranced by his environment and enters the lands of dream. The Aborigine is a listener and a performer. Kakadu National Park in Australia's wild northern territory, this modern listener enters a dream time of his own. It was, of any location, the fulfillment of a childhood dream. I knew my grandfather very little, but what I did know of him was that he came from Australia. The big challenge of the Outback was that it was out back, away from everything else. And of course, that's why I went there, because there wasn't really anybody else to speak of. And that was a little scary for me. I didn't know really what kind of dangers would be there. harsh, isolated outback has always inspired fear. The Aborigine's devil dance is a stern lesson to warn young children of the dangers lurking in the bush. The 
first danger Gordon encounters is a wildfire raging through the bush. Natural fires are common during the hot, humid pre-monsoon season. For a while, the nature recordist turns his attention to the riveting crackle of the blaze. But to find a dawn chorus of bird song, he must move beyond the huge fire's path. He scouts for locations, but fires all around. Gordon muses about the sounds that surround him. An interesting sound aspect about fire is that there's this rumbling sound of power. It definitely seems to cue of a of sort of a, a force which has shaped and maintained the landscape and the vegetation here. I suppose that's one reason that the bird song is really so rich and diverse that the birds flying up above and in the treetops aren't vulnerable to the fire that sweeps through the forest floor. There's hardly an area around here that I've seen which hasn't been burned at least once or twice in the last several years. morning, Gordon drives beyond the fire's reach to the edge of a swamp called a billabong, a haven for all sorts of wildlife. Gordon's been warned to stay clear of the water's edge where man-eating crocodiles lurk below the surface. Once he's set up, cautiously, Gordon begins to listen to the sound of an outback dawn. Suddenly, the song of a particular bird pierces the golden air. I've called him Willie, and I believe that he's a Willie Wagtail, but I never did see him. I only heard him. And when he started singing, I said, Oh, Willie, you sing to my heart. For the audio adventurer, this one bird song came to embody the eternal outback. So in many ways, the returning to the sounds of nature was, in a very real sense for me, returning to my homeland, to hear the same wave of birdsong that had swept over my grandfather a hundred years ago. The land of dream time has provided the fulfillment of a dream for Gordon and a successful dawn recording in one of Earth's most isolated spots. But Gordon must now face a new challenge, finding unspoiled sound in densely populated Asia. Technology clatters loudest in the teeming cities of developing countries. Two million people cram into the Sri Lankan city of Colombo, 
producing a din that's disorienting after the outback silence. But everywhere Gordon travels, Fritz is a hit. Soon, Gordon adjusts to human noise and is busy making friends. The great thing about being a nature listener and traveling is that I can use my wilderness listening skills to also to listen to the people around me. And there could be arguments around me, or there could be, you know, laughter surrounding a joke, and I can hear all of that in their voices without even understanding the language. But it's not the noise of human population that Gordon came to find. With 20 million people living on an island the size of his home state of Washington, he's concerned about finding a place where he and Fritz can be alone. So the stillness of the Sinaraja rainforest in the center of the island comes as a wonderful surprise. With his training as a botanist, Gordon knows that this environment offers all the ingredients for a stunning performance warm temperature, fresh water, and diverse vegetation. takes advantage of a clear jungle spring to refresh himself from his travels. He also washes his scent off Fritz. The warm-blooded smell has been attracting insects who spoil the recordings with their noisy buzzing. But it's hard to have only animals, insects, and a plastic head for company, especially in the jungle at night. There are those times alone in the field which you're there and you know you're desperate to tell a joke, even a bad joke, and there's Fritz. We like have the perfect marriage. He listens to everything I say and never talks back. A new dawn finds Gordon and Fritz in another of Sri Lanka's tropical environments, the savanna of the Udawalaway National Park. By standing at a distance, you could take in the summary sound, the sound of all the creatures happening at once, and it created a kind of music, a music which I didn't hear until later when I sat in and recorded the sounds of the village musicians.
When they played, I immediately saw the landscape of Sri Lanka. When you meet the Sri Lankan people, the Silanese, and see how they live, so simply, so gracefully, how they don't use John Deere tractors, how they use the, the ox and the water buffalo, how they walk instead of drive, and how they also, you know, take time to talk with each other. They're very unhurried. But in Sri Lanka, what they want to do by the year 2000 is bring electricity to each and every one of these villages. And in 10 years, I fear that they will erase something that their people have known for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and still have today. Gordon and Fritz spend a final Sri Lankan dawn at a remote place called the Horton Plain. Now these frogs, all in here, yeah, they um, they've been going round the clock, right? Yeah, day and night. Well, in between you get some other frogs, also other species that is coming in. And that's something this else. Is monkey. And you, that's the monkey giving the warning call when a leopard is seen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Their enthusiastic guide, Carlu, helps decipher this morning's chorus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are many leopards in the area? Quite a few, yeah. Gordon believes that being attuned to sound meant survival for our ancestors. And in Sri Lanka, he feels he's come closer to knowing the primal experience of man. By listening to nature sounds, we, in a sense, relive our past. Gordon's had remarkable success in finding pure nature sound in this crowded part of the world. Part of that he attributes to Sri Lanka's slower lifestyle, part to its wet, fertile environment. But the environment is about to change drastically as he heads for the south of Africa. arrived in Africa's spectacular Kalahari in the tenth year of a drought cycle. The wildlife is thin and hungry. 
part of the risk of letting planet Earth play itself is you never know what's going to happen. And when I first arrived on the Kalahari, I asked myself, why did I come here? You know, this is my greatest challenge. It's so dry. It's not like I was just going to be disappointed, but I was going to be tortured as well. Dawn at Gordon's first Kalahari location sounds as arid and devoid of life as the landscape. Because of the lack of water, birdsong is sparse and overridden by the rush of hot, dry wind. To find a better recording site, Gordon pushes on. Following a dry riverbed that forms the Botswanan border, Gordon and his guide head off in search of water that they hope will attract songbirds and wildlife. As they travel, Gordon sees ample evidence of the importance of listening. Sound is so important to the animal world that if you don't possess it, then you're almost immediately eliminated from your environment on the plate of somebody who can hear. Still searching, Gordon heads for a windmill that's been provided to draw water for wildlife. He hopes to hear bird song, but the air reverberates with the song of something else. And the closer and closer that I got to the windmill, it was almost as if I was beginning to go crazy. I was beginning to hear a sound that was like calling to me. The dry Kalahari wind passes through the windmill pipes with a hollow sound, quenching the traveler's thirsty ears. I felt so refreshed and I just immediately positioned the microphone system to capture that moment. And to this day, it's one of my most favorite recordings. In the evening, Gordon relaxes with his Kalahari guides. Biologist Richard Libersich is trying to help him find songbird habitat. The veteran tracker, Bertus, is helping him stay alive. But I've seen lions here quite often at this water hole. Well, I will have to remember to get out very slowly. Tomorrow. When I got up at what's called the hour of the lion, of course it was dark. And I had to, in every sense of the word, be a true listener, because my life depended on it. This hour of the lion finds Gordon at a place they call Bushman's Fountain. Bertus has guided him to a small spring the only natural source of water in the region. It's interesting to just gaze upon the rocks and look at all the early recordings, all the early memories of the animals. Try to imagine what was going on in the minds of the Bushmen.
The water at Bushman's Fountain encourages the dawn songs of the Kalahari's few remaining birds in a place made inhospitable, not by man, but by the rhythms of the earth itself. Soon, Gordon must leave this abode of ancient Bushmen for the civilization of Southern Europe. Spain hasn't changed much since another man who took on windmills traveled with an odd companion. In Don Quixote, Cervantes described dawn as the time when birds began to warble in the trees, when their varied and gladsome notes seemed to welcome and salute the fresh morn. Spain was actually the greatest invitation I've ever had to reconsider my position on including the sounds of people into the landscape. I chose Spain because I couldn't give up on all of Europe. And I had been advised that there was no noise-free listening left in Europe. The problem for me was that there was such a multiple land use so many activities would occur, and that there was a village every couple of miles. Sounds of human habitation drive Gordon up into the mountains. This time, the high altitude cold spoils the Sunrise Symphony. He's too high to find the Spanish bird song Cervantes described. All Fritz picks up is the wind in the pines. Everywhere Gordon turns, Spain provides frustration. When you'd like to have a wilderness experience, you need more than a couple miles. Put down an amazing 5,000 kilometers trying to find a place to record bird song without noise disturbance. I have to say, some of the sounds are really charming, though. The sounds of the, the goats and the cattle, they all wear bells up in the hillsides. Really enjoyed that quite a bit. Driven by his quixotic quest to find a lush dawn in Europe, Gordon winds up in a village near Dunyana National Park. Come nightfall, schoolgirls provide friendship for the lonely traveler and his electronic companion. Dawn in Dunyana sounds hopeful at first. But with the rising sun comes fog and human intrusion in Europe's largest nature preserve. Not only is it small by North American standards, but also it included 
motor activity. You could not walk around in the park. You actually had to ride inside of a vehicle. You go along the beach, with the dunes, and there would be commercial fishing vessels. There'd also be commercial harvesting of the shellfish. There'd be all this activity which was supposed to be compatible, and perhaps it was for them, with all the other uses of a national park. It's as if listening had been totally overlooked. The incessant clamor of industry is unavoidable everywhere Gordon and Fritz turn. In Europe, a noise-free dawn may truly be a thing of the past. It was also a grim reminder of where I would eventually wind up myself, back in North America, where the clatter of the motor would rule once again. But Gordon and Fritz have one last stop before returning home. The clatter of the motor also rules in the torpid Amazon basin of Brazil. By now, the naive American has become a seasoned world traveler. Gordon adopts Latin machismo as he eagerly heads inland up the world's longest waterway. The Amazon River was kind of surprising. Actually, it reminded me of the New Jersey Turnpike. And when you stop at one of the Amazon barges, it's sort of like pulling into Hojo's. But instead of getting a little hot dog in a bun, you might grab a little fish, you might get some more supplies, and then you're on your way. But the ambience is sort of just the same in the sense that there's really this bustle of activity. And so the the constant drumming, droning of the motors was immediately a sound that I knew that I had to get away from. In search of an escape from the drone of motors, Gordon heads up a tributary, sparsely populated by riverboat dwellers. Tomorrow, he'll try recording here. This Amazon dawn is ultimately a disappointment. The sounds from the river still intrude in the background. The strongest sound Gordon hears is the dawn bird song of civilization. The rooster's crow is a sure sign of encroaching development, a bad omen on the edge of a threatened rainforest. But Gordon wants Brazil to supply the grand crescendo of his dawn chorus recording. So he pushes on to the place he's been looking forward to, and dreading the most. The depths of the Amazon rainforest. Gordon struggles and sweats his way into the jungle. In the Amazon, when you're there alone, you're never there alone, because you're constantly reminded by your ears that you share the space with all these living creatures, some of which could have intentions on you. Gordon's base of operations is a research station deep in the forest. Here, ecologist Andrew Whitaker helps him interpret the sounds of the jungle. Now, what is that bird that I hear? You can hear some parakeets, gold-winged parakeets calling in the background. The, that's the uh, screaming pia. Screaming pia. Screaming pia. Okay. Or capital Jumata. Uh, capital uh, Jumata, the local uh, sport. That's the captain of the forest. All right.
finally, the jungle's many voices give Gordon the finale of his chorus of dawn. It's vast, it's marvelous, it's old, it's diverse. It's nature's symphony developed to its fullest. In the Amazon rainforest, too, it's, it's not as if the dawn chorus is just sung by birds. All of life participates. Gordon Hempton has captured what little is left of the sound of peace on Earth. His symphony of dawn is complete. It's time to follow the sunrise home. After nearly four months and six continents, the intrepid sound tracker has time to reflect on what he's heard. This was all just an experiment on my part. You know, an idea, a curiosity, and an idea that seemed to work. After I circled the globe and positioned myself once again the same spot of land, it's as if the world truly became round, even though I had been told it over and over again, it truly became round. Somewhere on planet Earth, the sun is just breaking the horizon. It just keeps on traveling around, an endless wave. 